Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Our listener support campaign continues, and you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. You can also support the show using the Zell app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. And I want to thank Kathleen for supporting the program that way. Thank you so much for your support, Kathleen. Now it's time to start this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. We'll be playing episodes 1 and 2 today and episodes 3 through 5 on Friday. Now here is the Calicles Matter, episodes 1 and 2, original air dates, April 30th and May the 1st, 1956. Let's take a listen. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Robert Ecker, Mr. Parsons' secretary. You telephone this office for an appointment with Mr. Parsons. That's right. I'm an investigator, Mr. Ecker. I was sent here by Eastern Casualty and Trust. We understand David Parsons is missing. I want to talk to Mr. Parsons Sr. about it. Well, Mr. Parsons Sr. isn't in the office today. He's home ill. This is pretty important, Mr. Recker. Maybe I better call him at home. Why don't you come to the office? I'll try to arrange to take you out there. I don't want to be a lot of trouble. There'd be more trouble if I didn't. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Expense account item one, $200.05, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived at midnight, went straight to the Beverly Hilton, had a good night's sleep, and woke up to an early spring heat wave. By nine o'clock, I had placed my call to Parsons, Stocks, and Bonds. At 10 o'clock, I met Robert Ecker in person. He was a man about my age with a thin face and good clothes. Judging from his office, the job as secretary was a pretty responsible one. I don't quite understand this, Mr. Dollar. What made you think that Mr. Parsons Jr. is missing? Is he around? You mean, is he in town? Yeah, is he in town? Is he around? Can I see him? Well, none of us exactly knows where he is, but he's not what you'd call missing. Well, now, that depends on how you look at it, Mr. Ecker. We understand David Parsons hasn't been seen for ten days. Is my information wrong? Well, no, no, what you say is true. You mean you're here to look into the matter? That's about it. May I say something? Sure. When you're speaking of David Parsons in front of his father, Mr. Parsons Sr., I suggest that you don't use that word missing. I'll try to remember that. The connotation might upset him. I'm certain he doesn't regard Mr. Parsons' absence in the missing sense. Maybe you can tell me how he does regard it. I'm afraid I can't. Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't confide in me. How about David Parsons' wife? Sorry. How about your own opinion? I'd rather keep my opinions to myself, Mr. Dollar. There's nothing personal, but uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. is very adamant about certain matters. In other words, uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. does all of the thinking for publication. So to speak, yes. What concern does the uh, Eastern... Casualty and Trust Company have in this matter? Yeah, so what is the bonding company's concern? A hundred thousand dollars. It was an automatic write-up on David Parsons Jr. when he entered the firm. I still don't understand. David Parsons had access to great amounts of money and transferable bonds here. That's where we're responsible, Mr. Recker. Is that an inference? If it sounds like I'm worried that David Parsons might have walked off with some money or some bonds, it's an inference. That's rather ridiculous, isn't it? I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Ricker. Well, I regard it that way. Mr. Parsons is worth a considerable amount of money. A million dollars would be a conservative estimate of his fortune. His father, of course, is 
Well, Mr. Parsons Sr. Yes, we're well aware of Mr. Parsons holding. But sometimes things aren't what they seem. You know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I don't know exactly what you mean, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, uh, take these, for instance. Mr. Dollar. Take these. Just here. These copies of Eastern Casualties policies on your desk, Mr. Recker. Now, let's see. You call me about nine. It's a little after ten now. That gave you an hour to dig them out, study them over, and answer for yourself the exact questions you've been making me answer. Isn't that about it, Mr. Recker? Yes. Yes, I'd say that's just about it, Mr. Dollar. Robert Ecker drove me out to the Bel Air home of David Parsons Sr. On the way, he spoke of the weather, the situation in Algiers, uh, the trouble he had making reservations for weekends in Palm Springs, and the low fuel consumption of his new Studebaker Golden Hawk. He avoided very carefully any further mention of David Parsons Jr., the missing son. I put a couple of direct questions to him, which he answered indirectly by referring me to Mr. Parsons Sr. So I let it go at that. Jenny? Jenny? Somebody must be around. You said your phone. I did. Jenny? Oh, hello. Hello, Robert. Nobody around? No one so far. They must be upstairs. He's been at it today. Called me over here an hour ago. Oh, I'm Mrs. Parsons. I'm Johnny Dollar. How do you do? I beg your pardon. You shouldn't, Robert. It was purposeful. Uh, Mrs. Parsons. I'm the one you're not supposed to meet, Mr. Dollar. I'm David's wife. I just received orders from upstairs that this matter will be handled upstairs. Is that so? Oh, yes, that's quite so. My father-in-law feels that he has extraordinary competence in this matter. As in all matters, huh, Robert? We'd better get along, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? No, I feel fine. I mean about your father-in-law handling it. That makes very little difference, Mr. Dollar. It's my husband who's missing, but his son. You're a, a policeman or a detective, aren't you? In a way, yes. You look like a very charming man, Mr. Dollar. Becker! Becker, is that you down there? Just a moment, Mr. Parsons. Hurry up! <laughs> you may have to practice some charm on him. Thank you for the tip, Mrs. Parsons. Not at all. It was nice to have met you. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Mrs. Parsons. We'd better get up there. Ecker! Robert Ecker led me upstairs into a massive bedroom that could only have been decorated for a massive old man, which is exactly what David Parsons Sr. turned out to be. Six and a half feet tall, I guessed at it, since he was stretched out in bed. He had a pair of coal black eyes and white hair liberally sprinkled with gray. He spilled a briefcase full of papers and documents off the bed, punched his pillow around, and glared hard at me. What's his name? This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Parsons. You see if he had any credentials? No, sir. Well, I... find out! Mr. Dollar. Sure, sure. Here, look these over. I look them over. Hand them to me. Yes, Mr. Parsons. They could be forgeries. It could be a newspaper reporter, something like that. Go downstairs and use the hall phone. Call this company and see if they have anyone named Johnny Dollar working for them. Hurry it up. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Those credentials are genuine. You know it and I know it, Mr. Parsons. I'm not waiting around here while you call Boston and talk to someone there you won't believe either. Now, I'm at the Beverly Hilton. You call me when you've made up your mind to talk about this matter. Fine. Now get out. I got in town last night and contacted your office first thing. I wanted to talk to you about it first for several reasons. One, you're David Parsons' father. It's your company, not his, that can be jeopardized in a situation like this. Two, you seem the logical man to see to clear up the matter easily. Now that I've seen you, I'm not so sure of that. I'll have to go to somebody else. Wait a minute. What do you mean, go to somebody else? I mean, I'm not going to sit in a hotel room cooling my heels waiting for you to call me. I have to find out about this, and there are other people to talk to. Your son's wife, the whole household. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. The police, if I have to. I'd break you. I'd break you in half. Then I'd get pretty mad, and both halves of me would figure this thing out if it took a million years and a million dollars. Ecker. Yes, sir? Get out of here. Yes, sir. You've got five minutes. I've got five minutes and ten minutes and a million minutes if I need them. We have a report your son's been missing for ten days now. One of our brokers reported it. He happened to be one of your son's clients. Missing. All right, where is he? How would I know? I take that to mean you don't know. Do you have any ideas? Of course not. Have you had an audit of your books since he disappeared? What? Have you had an audit? Is there anything missing? Bonds, cash in the company? Ecker! Ecker! 
Throw this bum out of here and make sure he bounces a couple of times. Mr. Parsons. Throw him out! I've got you by a good 25 pounds, Ecker. Maybe you'd better leave, Mr. Dollar. I think I'll stay. Oh, if I could get out of this bed, I'd do it my... Ecker! Run along, Mr. Ecker. He'll calm down. I can wait him out. You leave without throwing him out and you're fired. Throw him out! I'll wait for you downstairs, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> All right. Sit down. What day is today? Friday. It was a week ago Tuesday. David left the house, according to his wife, and that's the last anyone saw him. No word, nothing since then. No police? Of course not, no police. I can hear you, I can hear you. Why? You know why as well as I do. An investment broker missing. What the papers wouldn't do with that? What's been going on? Nothing. We've been waiting to hear from him. No one's done anything? What is there to do that won't bring out the press? Look, I'm not worried about the press. I'm worried about your son, Mr. Parsons. Whatever happened to him has had a ten-day start. And nothing's been done about it. Now, how about the books? What about them? Have you had an audit? Now, look here, you Keep young... Your voice now, will you? I ask you a simple question. Have you found anything missing? I haven't looked. Where are you going? Well, if what you say is true, no one's seen or heard of David Parsons for ten days, then I'm going to get some help. What help? Police. I don't want any police in on this! How much does your responsibility come to? A hundred thousand dollars. I'll post it in cash. You'll what? I'll post that amount of money and assume your liability, if there is a liability. You'll never get a fair offer than that. I don't want this matter to get into the papers. Well? Look, Mr. Parsons, we have assumed liability, and we can't transfer it at this date. It's, it's out of the question. So let's start our planning from there. I met Mrs. Parsons downstairs. I understand she's not supposed to meet me or see me. Now, is that right? Yeah. Well, you better fix up that part of it. That's so? Yeah. Suppose I don't. I'll see her anyhow. Get out of here! He was looking for something to throw when I stepped out the door and walked down the hall to the stairway. At the foot of the stairs, I looked around for Robert Eckert, who wasn't around. I found my hat by the door, and then I ran into Mrs. Parsons again. Mr. Dollar. Yes? What's been decided? What's he going to do about David? Well, it's pretty hard to say what he's going to do about anything. What are you going to do? I was going to drive over to your house this afternoon and ask you to go to the police and make out a missing persons report. If you refused to do that, I was going to the police myself and ask their help. Oh. Do you think that's the thing to do? I mean, a missing person report? Yep. I think that's the thing to do. I'll be home later this afternoon. He might hear us. All right. Say two o'clock? Fine. You cool off? Oh, for a second or two. <laughs> Some museum piece he is. Be careful of him, Mr. Dollar. He'll break your heart. He's your kind. You're his dish of meat. Yeah. I didn't pay much attention to that remark from Robert Ecker. I thought about Sven Gali and Rasputin and a couple of fellas like that. I didn't think of Parsons Sr. in the same class with them. But I should have guessed it. Ecker's trying to tell me, but I just wouldn't listen. Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. David Parsons. Well. I called Mr. Ecker and he told me where you're staying. I was just on my way out to your home, Mrs. Parsons. Well, I'd rather you didn't come to the house, Mr. Dollar. Couldn't I meet you somewhere? Well, sure. But better still, why don't I come by your hotel and pick you up? That'll be all right. Fifteen minutes, is that too soon? Well, that's fine. Uh, Mrs. Parsons. Yes? Your father-in-law know you're meeting me? If he did, I think he'd kill me. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. <laughs> Item 2, $4.55, one long-distance phone call to Dave Blaine, Chief Investigator for Eastern Casualty. I explained to him that in spite of our information that David Parsons, Jr. had been missing for 10 days... People in Los Angeles connected with him seemed indifferent or irritated by an investigation. I told him how old man Parsons had tried to throw me out three times when I got around to suggesting that perhaps his son might have flown the coop with some money and bonds. Blaine told me to keep trying and keep on trying to get to the bottom of it. 
I took him at his word. It was a little after two o'clock when I saw Mrs. Dorothy Parsons pull up in front of the Beverly Hilton lobby. She wore a ribbon to hold her hair back in the convertible. A sundress showed off a pair of well-tanned shoulders. The dark glasses, the cigarette holder, and the smile did the rest in making her a very pretty woman. I suppose I look worried. I keep you waiting long? No, 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 not at all. What's the matter? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do, too. It, it just struck me. I'm here to see about your missing husband. Now it looks like we're going on a picnic. I think you don't have to wear sackcloth and ashes to do your job. No, really, do you? Well, it sometimes helps on a job like this. You disapprove of me, don't you? I disapprove of everybody. I have to, Mrs. Parsons. All the time? Forever? Only until a thing's straightened out. Until you separate the chaff from the wheat, I suppose. Yeah. Where are we going? Well, I thought you might like a drive down by the ocean. I'd rather be facing you across a desk. You shan't do that, Mr. Dollar. I won't allow it. Stop looking so glum. How's that? Oh, I don't know. I just don't know. Would you feel any better if you faced me across a luncheon table? That's as close to a desk as I can think of. Yeah, let's try that out. I gave her what I could of a smile and let her think it over. She drove well, keeping her eyes to the road, both hands on the wheel. She was a careful kind. The rearview mirror was adjusted two or three times, looking for traffic cops. We went off Sunset Boulevard and onto the road that is set right by the ocean. The sun was shining. The air was warm. And I got to thinking, what business did I have worrying about a missing man on such a nice day? Oh. What is it? Come on. I'm tired of driving. Let's walk along that lovely strip of beach. Oh, uh, now, wait please, a minute. Please, Mr. Dollar, please. It's such a lovely day and the air is so good. Walk with me. Talk with me. Just a little while and then we can talk about all these other things, please. I married David when I was not quite 18. He was almost 30. Let me see, that was 14 years ago. 14 years Go on. He joined his father's firm, and he's been there ever since. We live well, socially, economically. I guess I belong to the keep your social position in mind club, don't I? I don't know. What do you think of me? I uh, met you today to talk about your husband, Mrs. Parsons. But I've been talking about my husband. I told you about meeting him, about being married to him. What else is there to tell? Now tell me about missing him. What can I tell you about that? Well, where he is, for one thing. I don't know. Any ideas? No, none. You're so pretty, I almost believe you. Oh, uh, you are a human being. But I don't believe you. I don't care. Tell me how pretty I am. I don't understand you. I didn't understand your father-in-law. David Parsons is missing. No one wants to talk about it, do anything about it, make any moves. Now, what is this? You're cross with me now. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I'd assume you'd want me to talk to somebody about your husband. You'd want to talk to somebody, too, that you'd, that you'd want him back, want to know if he's well, if he's in trouble. And what happens? You spend an hour on a sunny afternoon showing me your best profile, doing everything, but getting down to the business at hand. I don't get it. I'm sorry. I guess I don't blame you. What is it you want to know? When did you see him last? Last Tuesday morning at breakfast at home. Tell me about him. There's nothing to tell, really. He ate his breakfast, read his paper, put on his coat, kissed me and left. I called his office at noon about something or other and his secretary told me he hadn't come in. I really didn't know he wasn't around till Wednesday afternoon late. How's that? Well, Tuesday night, I... I went out with friends. Wednesday, I slept late. I presumed David was in bed when I came in. I didn't look in his bedroom. Wednesday afternoon, Mr. Ecker called and asked to speak to David. Mr. Ecker told me David hadn't been in his office all day Tuesday. I checked his bedroom, and his bed hadn't been slept in Tuesday night, so I called my father-in-law. Why didn't you call the police? Why should I? It only seems reasonable to me. Go on. Mr. Parsons told me not to mention the matter to anyone, that he'd take care of it. He hinted... Oh, I'm bad at this, Johnny, because well, you have no idea of 
Well, I mean, Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't hint. He's a very blunt person. I met him this morning, yeah. But I'll say he hinted that David might have gone off with someone else. I see. Has he ever disappeared before? Oh, yes, many times. When was the last time? Oh, last fall. For three days he was gone. And before that it was in the spring. He was gone for a matter of five or six days. When he came home on these occasions, uh, what did he say? What did he do? Nothing. Oh, no, I can't believe that. I mean, if he's gone a few days without leaving any kind of word, when he returned, he must have had some explanation for it. Oh, I suppose he did. He might have said something about getting even. I, I don't recall. Well, look at me. Now, this is serious. I'm looking at you. You said you've been married to him 14 years. You said he joined his father's firm shortly after. Yes. What did he do before that? He studied and traveled. Didn't work? Well, he wrote or something. I don't know. What kind of a man is he? He's David Parsons, Jr. He's impeccable, brilliant, and honest. As a husband. Aren't you overstepping yourself somewhere? A lot of personal questions will have to be answered about him by someone. He's a very devoted husband and father. Except for those times when he disappears. Except for those times, yes. Do you suppose he'll reappear this time? Yes, of course. Why? Don't you? He's your husband, not mine. The wind's coming up. Yes. Do you like some lunch? I feel very much like going home. All right. Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Did you expect me to make love to you out here this afternoon? What kind of question is that? It's to the point. Did you? Yes. Why? It's not a nice question to ask me. I think sometimes I'm quite attractive. Well, I think you must be attractive all the time. Thank you. Why didn't you kiss me? We, uh... Don't have to go into that. Unless, of course, you want to tell me why you stalled me all afternoon. Do you? Touché, Mr. Dollar. One thing more. When I spoke with you earlier, you asked my advice in this matter. I advise you call the police about your husband. Did you? You know I did. I also advise your father-in-law to do the same thing. He said he'd kill me and himself before he'd call the police in. You said, or I thought you said, you'd call him in anyhow. That you were concerned about your husband and wanted him found. Did I get that wrong? I don't want any police, Mr. Dollar. I don't think they're necessary. David will come back. No police. What made you change your mind? Your father-in-law? You said you only had one more question. I lied. I've got a thousand questions. I should call home. Come on. We walked up to the highway and climbed back into the car. She drove to the nearest filling station and public telephone booth. I waited in the car while she made a phone call. Some high school kids drove up in a jalopy in sweatshirts and jeans. They waved ten pounds of wieners at me for no reason at all and asked me if I'd like to go on a wiener fry. I told them no. An old man with a bamboo fishing pole came in. He dropped a soggy gunny sack on the pavement while he disappeared around at the back. I went over and peeked in. Three pretty good-sized perch smelled out at me. I looked off at the ocean. Just in time to see a pair of surfboard riders catch the creamy top of a roller, climb up on their feet, and wave to their girlfriends sitting in the sand. Nothing was wrong with the world. Nothing at all. Life was going on just fine. David Parsons, Jr. had been missing ten days, and nothing was wrong at all. I lit up a cigarette. What difference did it make if a man was missing ten days? Not a bit. Especially to his wife, who looked her prettiest when she told me practically nothing about his disappearance. The ashes fell on my lap. I'm sorry I took so terribly long, Mr. Dollar. I had to call my father-in-law's home, too. There was a message for me. Look, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go over your head, your father-in-law's head, everybody's. When I get back in town, I'm going to tell the police about this. I just decided while I was sitting waiting for you. There won't be any need for that. Huh? David's come back. What? He's home. Now, that was the message. He'll be there when we get there. You see, all of your worry was for nothing. You and I, we could have had a perfectly lovely afternoon if we'd known this, couldn't we? If you say so, Mrs. Parsons. Look out! You all right, brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Take, take it easy. Better give me a hand with her. Can somebody call an ambulance? Yeah, sure. You you take it easy. I'll take care of her until... What? What, what is it? I'm sorry, mister. She's dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, trouble comes early and stays late. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Now, I do want to preface my comments by saying that as I record this, I've got a bit of a cold. So that may be why my voice sounds off, if you notice that. Now, I don't record these live. In fact, uh, I'm recording this nine days before the episode releases. So hopefully, by the time it releases, this will have resolved one way or another. I'm recording right now just to make sure that we can stay on schedule in terms of the show editing and things like that. All right, that out of the way, I thought this was a very intriguing first two episodes. And I think that the scene between Johnny and Mr. Parsons Sr. was a really solid scene. And part of Johnny's strength as an insurance investigator is that he is not pushed around by all these people who think they should control the agenda. He understands his duties, he understands his rights and his options as an investigator. I do wonder about the Swingali and Rasputin comparisons, and we'll have to see how those hold up over the course of the whole story. The ending to episode two was a bit jarring. It's certainly one way to end with a bang, although it doesn't appear uh, case-related, so it's just like they had a random fatal car wreck. Listener comments and feedback now, and we start with uh, this comment from Derek, who emails in, Johnny Dollar equals bacon wrap filet mignon. Mr. Chameleon equals microwave chicken nugget. This is the first week I listened to Mr. Chameleon after Johnny Dollar. Big mistake. Well, I have often said that our podcast 
caters to a wide variety of different tastes, but I've never heard anyone put it quite like that. Though granting the analogy for a moment, there are a lot of people who love chicken nuggets, so... We move on to YouTube, where a listener wrote in on the Salt City matter. I concur with the listener who wrote about doing the serials daily as they originally aired. That would be authentic, if nothing else. But I dare say that would be a lot of work for the host. We have to remember, too, that many of the 13 to 15 chapter cliffhanger movie serials would be later released in feature format running about three hours. So there is a prima fascia for running them as they are. Regarding this serial, this is a powerhouse. Bob Bailey just nails it every time. Well, thank you for the comment. And it's mainly with the format of the current podcast that it would be difficult to do that. There are other formats where it does work. John Dunning, the late great radio historian, hosted an old-time radio show that played a variety of old-time radio. I don't know whether his show was one hour or two hours in length, but he went through the entirety of the Johnny Dollar serials on a daily basis a couple of times. If I ever found myself hosting a show like that, it would work, but I don't expect that I will. Then Catherine had some praise for the uh, second episode that we played of Indictment, Excellent episode. I like this better than last week's. And then we go over to Spotify where Terry writes, Love Johnny Dollar and Boston Baki. Listen every night to fall asleep to. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And then we have a new review in the Apple Podcast Store from AB Senior up in Canada. And AB writes, My favorite company while I walk in the woods. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your comment and taking time to leave a review in the Apple Store. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Rebecca, Patreon supporter since February of 2021, currently supporting the podcast at the master detective level of $15 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support, Rebecca. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of this week's Johnny Dollar Serial. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Well, suppose we head for the Malayan Peninsula, down to Singapore, then over to Sumatra, Java, Borneo. Sounds fine. Something sure ought to happen in one of those places. Yeah, something will, all right. The question is, what? Well, come on, let's get underway. What time is it, Mike? Almost 2400. Midnight, huh? Pretty bright moonlight. Yeah. I didn't realize there were so many little islands here along the Malayan coast. Yeah, a flock of them. Not too much room between these two. If we hold on this course, we should clear okay. Steady as you go, Tennessee. Sure enough, Skip. I, I mean, I, sir. <laughs> hey, that's funny. Hmm? That island over on our right. I thought I saw a light for a second. Oh, where? Near the point. I don't see any. Wait. There's a junk coming around that point right ahead of us. Hey, there comes some more of them. How can find other islands, eh? Hey. They've got machine guns. Get down! Man, that's too close. Real too close. That's their standard gag. They rake the bridge, hope to kill off everyone there right off the bat. What do you mean? What's Who's in those junks? Malayan pirates, hijackers. These waters are lousy with them. Pretty well armed, pirates. Sure, that's where some of those smuggled guns end up. Okay, so we drop this Captain Jagger routine and have ourselves a little naval engagement. First, we've got to have room to maneuver this baby. Tennessee? Right full rudder. Right full rudder. Steve, what's the matter? Take a look astern of us. Hey, two more junks back there. They just popped out from behind that island on the left. Well, this is just great. Three junks ahead of us, two behind us, and an island on each side. We're bottled up, Mike, but good. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.